This is a little book that I wrote in 2000. We published it in 2006. We actually had it uh, printed here in Michigan. There's about 11,000 of these little uh, things circulating across the Adventist world. It's out of print now. We're trying to get more. Cleanse and Close, Last Generation Theology in 14 Points. It's all Bible, and we're trying to just here put it in a positive sense, the key, some of the very key things about what Seventh-day Adventists believe the Bible teaches, something that's present truth for this time. Now, I've been asked to present some of this material a little bit later this year, and I have kind of a dilemma because... They're, how do you do it? So I'm going to do something with you that's kind of an experiment. So you ever heard of getting at the fire hose? Here comes the fire hose. I'm going to give you four chapters of this, but I, I've actually, it's harder to do it. I've, I've kind of compressed it down, and so, and so this is kind of an experiment. We'll see if this works or not. But the last generation, have you heard that phrase? In recent years, we have uh, been hearing many different things about the idea of the last generation. Uh, some, some see the idea as simply describing God's gospel purpose for end-time Christians. Some see this as an attack on Christianity. They even say that it's an unchristian heresy. So, very wide range of views. It's fascinating that something so fundamental, something that should be so clear and so obvious, so indisputably true or false, could come up to so much, to be so much in dispute. Is it really that difficult to understand the Bible? Are the inspired writings God has given us so plastic and so malleable that they can easily be misunderstood? At the core of the message and mission of God's church, if that core is so disputable, how can we anticipate uniting together to give a faithful work and see Jesus win the great controversy between good and evil? How can it be that these things are so hard to understand that theologians get confused and want to um, fight against God's truth? I don't believe that these things are hard to understand. When we start with the Bible and end with the Bible, I think we're going to find that we can understand them quite well. And I don't think you have to be an expert uh, or have a pointy head to understand these things. I think that God has given truth for the scholar and the common person alike. And, and so uh, now I've got a, there's about 150 verses I'm, I have today, and I can't possibly speak them all. So I want you to know that later today I'll be publishing this on my website, greatcontroversy.org. So if you look later today, eventually it'll, it'll be hanging there, all the text. Uh, but I'm going to go through four chapters, four compressed chapters, and i um, going to lay out some of these key Bible ideas that, that help us understand the, uh, the last generation. So, so basically, here's kind of my plan. There's going to be five or six of these. The first three... I'm going to go through and do these compressed presentations out of these chapters. And then the last ones, I'm going to get into some history. There are going to be new things you've never, you've never heard before. But I'll invite you to compare them with, with the Bible and with history. And I think you're going to see some things you've, you've maybe never seen before. So anyway, that's my plan. And... You've got a lot ahead, so I hope you're ready. I hope you weren't up late last night staring at your phone or something. So, um, all right, let's begin. Number one, the first section, born with weaknesses and tendencies toward evil. Man was designed to live, not to die. He was wired to succeed, not to fail. But when Adam disobeyed, his nature was catastrophically disordered, and since then, humans are born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil. Humans enter life needing divine help to seek God and his righteousness. Do you think you, sir, you, you seek God on your own? Think again. It's because of God's mercy that you seek him. God made all things through Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, Visible and invisible, all things were created by him and for him. 
Matthew 22, 32, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You serve a living God. Some people think that Christians must serve a dead God because of the way we behave. We kind of mope around and go around frowny and, um, and oh boy, whatever God they're serving, that's, that's, I'm not sure I want that one. We should remember that we serve a living God. Like the hymn says, I serve a risen Savior and he's in the world today. God designed man to live and to flourish, not to die, Ezekiel 18. Made in the divine image, Genesis chapter 1, mankind was given freedom to think and to do. He, he designed us in our deepest depths to be worshiping beings. God shows humans what is right and what is wrong, but he doesn't force us to choose right. And so everything began with free choice. God created a being worthy of the hand that gave him life. His design is for us to be holy, healthy, and happy. But I'm not sure. I think some people don't have any of the H's. Some people are not happy. They're not holy, and they're not healthy. God's plan is otherwise. We were created as moral beings to make moral choices, to have our home in a moral universe, and to echo the righteousness of a moral God. Adam and Eve were created with an original enmity toward evil. There's a word we don't hear anymore, enmity. God wants us to be at odds with the devil, and that's the plan. But they started with that, but they foolishly abandoned that. From failure in the first generation, however, the great controversy proceeds until success in the last generation. God puts enmity toward evil back in place. And you know the text, don't you? Genesis 3, verse 15. The woman, the seed of the woman, is going to put enmity back. Well, that doesn't sound very tolerant and multi, multi this or that, does it? But God is going to put back enmity so that we can be an enemy relationship with the devil, not a friend relationship. And so, can he do it? Can God help us? Can he do it without being unfair when he does it? Adam and Eve were evicted from the garden, but you know God is merciful, and opportunity was given to repent. A lamb was provided. Revelation 13.8 says that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. As soon as there was sin, there was a savior. Jesus promised he would die in man's place. He would take the penalty of the law broken, and he would be broken for us. He would become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Maybe you've heard that somewhere before. Adam had been, Adam had been changed because of his choice to sin, and all of his descendants experienced the results. Our race is weakened by the impact of thousands of years of disobedience. You wonder why you're so good at sinning. Thousands of years of disobedience helps. Each generation is degraded compared to the one before our race, damaged at the fall, has been decreasing in physical strength, in mental power, and in moral worth. Our powers have decreased in a long downward slide. Each generation is born more damaged than the one preceding. The liabilities received are stronger in every newborn child. But I ask you, is anything more practical than knowing that there can be no help for us in our fallen humanity? God alone can reach down and save us. Jesus is himself the ladder whose base, whose base can reach down, rests on the earth, and whose top rung reaches to the gate of heaven. Had that ladder been even one step short of reaching us, humanity would be forever lost. But Christ reaches us where we are. We call it good news. Evangelion, the gospel, good news. He took our nature and overcame that we, through taking his nature, might overcome. He asks us through faith in his empowering grace to echo the glory of God's character. Though we are born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil, Jesus is ready to give victory all the way to glory. Let's look at a text, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, verse 21. The Bible's filled with promises. Here's just one of them. But it's a good one. It's a, very interesting because it comes to us in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. 
And Jesus says this to us, Revelation 3, verse 21. To him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Isn't that a good promise? He just can't wait for that day. He wants that day soon, and I want it soon too. God has help for us. He's brought the ladder down. Jesus has come down to help us. We receive neither sin nor guilt nor condemnation from someone else's fall, but, you know, we are thrust into a situation where we need healing that only Jesus can provide. So let us speed to his side for helping strength. The Bible tells us again and again that he's ready for us to come to him for help. Okay, now section two, lost because of personal choices. Men and women will be lost because of personal choices, not because of being born with disordered natures. History screams that after the fall, humans are broken. The human timeline traces a catalog of atrocities. Lostness is the inevitable result of misusing our God-given freedom. Adam and Eve were free moral agents, but you know what? They abused the opportunity and permitted themselves to be overcome by appetite. Distrusting God, what did they do? They sold their innocence. By their own free will, they became sinners and separated themselves from the favor of God. And maybe we should look at Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. Because we sometimes forget how it is that we become sinners. Isaiah 59 in verse 2 tells us we don't have to guess. We don't have to... Uh, find some old Catholic theology and pull it out and go with that. The Bible tells us, notice Isaiah 59 verse 2, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You see, it is our sins, not Adam's sins. I don't need Adam's sins. I've got enough of my own mistakes and sins I've done. That's what condemns me is my own. So it's my sins that separate me from God. I shouldn't blame anybody else. God is ready, though, to heal us. But what we see here is this was when Adam and Eve went away, it was choice and operation. They were misusing their free will. Let me ask you a question. Why do you kill the mosquito in your house? You kill it because that insect is beyond redemption. You cannot communicate with it. You cannot persuade it to go against its instinctive programming. And it's not made in the image of God. It has no capacity of moral choice. You can't do catch and release. You know, you're not going to put up a mosquito trap, right? And, and wait for the thing to go into the mosquito trap. And then you're going to take it outside and release it into the wild. None of you would do that. <laughs> you can't reason with it. It's, it's, it's not safe. Mosquitoes carry diseases such as malaria, filariasis, yellow fever, dang, encephalitis, West Nile virus, and that's just, that's just the beginning of the list. I bet you didn't know this. Through disease transmission, mosquitoes have caused more human deaths than any other creature. More humans have died because of mosquitoes. Yes. They're a health risk for us and for our children. They're not safe to save, and they cannot be made safe to save. We make a distinction between evil and guilt. Trees and animals are full of sin's results, but they're neither condemned nor redeemed by God. They have no knowledge of moral values. Only man has a knowledge of moral values. And because of this knowledge, he is condemned as guilty for evil acts. The atonement addresses guilt by what? By forgiving it. And it addresses evil results by recreating and restoring what the curse what the curse of sin has done. So the roses, the roses in front of your house have little thorns on them. The skunks that go by have their features. And I don't think that's the way it was in the garden, do you? But evil in the world is an indirect byproduct of sin. When one animal kills another one, we don't regard it as guilty, do we? It acts according to its programming. But if a human kills another human, we react differently. Why? Because humans are made in God's image. We have conscience. We are moral beings. We can know and harmonize with God's will. One human being killing another usually is not only an issue of evil, but also of guilt. 
So we make a distinction between evil and guilt. Only when we tolerate an impure thought, only when we cherish an unholy desire is our soul contaminated. If you don't believe me, read James chapter 1. Satan sends unsolicited messages. He suggests and arouses thoughts and feelings that annoy even the most consecrated. If these thoughts and feelings are not cherished, if they are repulsed as hateful, the soul is not contaminated with guilt. Condemnation comes when light is given but rejected or neglected. That's John chapter 3. We're not, we're not uh, contaminated when something evil happens near us, but when we embrace it, now that's a different matter. Jesus' suffering and death has made atonement for all sins of ignorance, all the effects of sin, such as illness, physical or mental defects, de deterioration leading to death. All those things are addressed by the atonement. Neither sins of ignorance nor the effects of sin incur guilt or condemnation, nor do they require repentance, confession, or forgiveness. Those responses apply only to the sins for which we are guilty. We're going to make a strong distinction between evil and guilt, between evil and sin. Okay? Every homeward step in our experience can deepen our repentance. We can never be satisfied to reflect a character only partly like Christ while persisting in some measure in selfishness. God will reveal to us, God will reveal to all of us our illegitimate internal commitments to self-service. Why? So that we can experience in our lives the situation of sinlessness in which Adam lived before the fall. I'm going to say that again because it's a little bit, I want you to think about it. It's a strong thing to say. God will reveal to all of us our illegitimate internal commitments to self-service so that we experience in our lives the situation of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his fall. Do you think God can do that? The Lord's Prayer is going to reach its mark. What did he say? Remember what Jesus taught them? He will deliver us from evil, deep hidden evil that only the Holy Spirit can and will bring to light. Matthew 6, verse 13. Do you think that God can deliver us from evil? Or do you think we have to say, God, it's too bad you weren't strong enough. If only you were stronger, I'd be more victorious. How's that going to work out? I don't think that argument's going to get very far. Our faulty nature still answers to the will. Our flesh of itself cannot act contrary to our own will. Our body is wired to our mind. Our flesh can never be condemned apart from our personal choices. If we use our will to rebel, then we're choosing moral wrong. And that's when we're condemned. You know, if you get into a fight and you're standing before the judge now, do you think this argument's going to work very well? Judge, I'm innocent. I didn't have any, it was, I have nothing to do with it. My fist, my fist just, just hit him. And all the time I was saying to my fist, stop. Do you think that you're going to get off with that? Is that going to work for you? The judge is going to say, well, it looks to me like that fist is connected to your brain. Isn't that true? Our faulty nature responds to the will. We're not born guilty, but we're born ready to become guilty. We're not born with sin, but you know what? We are born ready, <laughs> very ready to sin. We're ready to go astray. Isaiah 53, 6 says that all have gone astray. All we like sheep have gone astray, right? From the first fall in Eden, the power of evil became closely identified with our human nature. But you know what? We're condemned only for our own disobedient choices, our own sin. The practical, ben practical benefit to us of this understanding is that it, all these dodges from responsibility, all these excuses for disobedience, those all go away. You can't say to the judge, it wasn't me, it was my fist. That's not going to work. Personal choices make me responsible. Sinful indulgence is starved in order to make a Christian. Somebody, I wrote a little, read a little book, and this person said that Christianity is a battle and a march. And when I look at my experience, I can say, Absolutely true. I mean, at least I don't know about you, but I'm not gliding in. I'm not gliding into the kingdom on a magic carpet. This is a battle and a march. I am not where I want to be, and I don't think you are either. That's my guess. 
When we understand that sin is choice, God's character is not impeached for being unjust. His gift of free choice exalts the morality of his goodness and respect for his creation. He is shown fair in his relations and interactions with his beloved creatures. He's ready to empower us to live above the hell-bent inclinations of our nature. God will help you. When you are inclined to go the wrong way, God will help you. Without clarity concerning what sin is, there can be no clarity concerning what righteousness is. Without clarity on what righteousness is, we cannot know the difference between right and wrong. But we're left then to guess at what changes are needed in our behavior. Did you hear the experiment about the, uh, the rats? They put these rats in a cage, and they put a little bar there. They were to press, and when they press the bar, they get food, right? And so they did experiments with these rats. And one of them, one group of rats, they had it so that things happened. They, they, were elect, they got an electric shock at just, it was predictable. They could tell. You know, if I do this, I get the electric shock. They figured it out really quick, by the way. And then they had another group of rats in cages, and they had it set up so that they would get the electric shock totally randomly, totally independent of, of their actions. Which group of rats do you think came out pretty good mentally, and which, one do you th which group of rats do you think died? I don't have to tell you, do I? God is not arbitrary or random. And so we need to know what is right and what is wrong. And God hasn't left us guessing. In the Bible, he tells us what's right and what's wrong. I don't have to guess. And I don't, I'm not left to kind of say, well, if I step over here, will I get zapped? Will I get zapped one time and not the next time? God doesn't leave us there. So God gives us clarity about what sin is in the Bible. By the way, sin, how you define sin, is the, is the continental divide of the gospel, really. You know, have you heard of the continental divide? There's a place that runs north and south through North America, I guess through every continent, uh, and um, all the rain, all the precipitation that happens on the west, it happens to be it come through Montana and go on south. All the rain that falls on the west side drains ultimately, that precipitation will finally get into creeks and rivers and land in the Pacific Ocean. And all the uh, precipitation that makes it over the Continental Divide and comes along eastward, it's going to come down through the rivers and things, it's going to wind up in the Atlantic Ocean. The Continental Divide is the highest point on the water table on, on the continent. And depending on where the water falls, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall out one way or the other. I want to tell you that 1 John 3, verse 4, is the Bible's continental divide. It tells us what sin is. Do you remember what that verse says? 1 John 3, 4, sin is the blank of the law. Sin is the transgression. New King James Version has sin as lawlessness. The Greek word is anomia, anom uh, a lawlessness. And so transgression is a very good way to put it in the King James Version. When it comes to your view of the gospel, everything hinges on how you answer the question, what is sin? Is it choice or is it nature? Is it what we think and do or is it what we are? God might have created man without the power to transgress his law. He might have in intervened and prevented Eve from eating the forbidden fruit. But you know what? Then men and women would have been just kind of robotic, wouldn't they? Without freedom of choice, obedience wouldn't have been voluntary. It, wouldn't have been, it would have been forced. There could have been no development of character. And so love could not have been experienced because you cannot force love. Imagine somebody saying, love me, love me or else. See how that works? It can't. It can't work. And so God left us with free will, and he didn't force us to love him. We were only, were we only a race of biological robots, intelligent creatures incapable of choice, and God's moral demands upon us? Follow the reasoning. They would be unreasonable, right? His requirements would be unfair because we have an inability to choose and do the right. Satan's charge that God makes unfair demands upon his children would be actually, uh-oh, true. God's goodness would be impeached. Thankfully, that's not how he is, and that's not how we are. God made man upright, Ecclesiastes 7.29, but he sought out many devices. He made us in his image, Genesis chapter 1. He gave noble traits of character. 
with no bias toward evil. Do you think that Adam and Eve started out with just a little bit of evil just to get it spicy and interesting? No, no, no. But man did choose disobedience and death. The result was a bent, disordered nature inclined to evil. And yet we could be made safe to save. Congratulations, you're better off than the mosquitoes. The mosquito has bad equipment, so do we. But we were made in God's image, just a little lower than the angels. You know, I think a lot of times we feel like God is infinitely up there, and, and he is. But we just can't be holy. We're just doomed to perpetual failure. But the Bible tells us what? That God made us just a little bit lower than the angels. We think like we're like, you know, microscopic and the angels, you know, the green giant. But no, the Bible says we're a little lower than the angels. So give yourself, not give yourself, give God some credit. He knew what he was doing. And he can make us safe to save. We inherit everything that Adam and his descendants could pass on. We inherit all the leanings, all the tendencies, all the desires, and so we're born in a way that God did not originally plan. But sin comes through choice, and sin itself is not inherited. Does God hold me guilty or condemned for this bent, disordered nature that I'm born with? Or is the sin for which I'm guilty due to choices that I make? And how we answer that question determines how we understand God's salvation plan. In fact, our answer is reflected in our vision of the Christian life. And we've said it before, too. Isn't it, isn't it true? Sometimes somebody does something and you, you get so unhappy and you say, S don't say that. You're making me angry. Nobody's making you angry. You're choosing to be made angry. Isn't it true? Let's be honest. Now, people can be pretty provocative, I admit it, but we're, we choose it. Can you imagine somebody coming? What about Jesus? Do you think that, that Jesus, can you imagine Jesus saying to somebody, now stop saying that, you Pharisees, just stop it. You're, you're wearing me out. In fact, uh, you're, you're making me angry. We can't imagine Jesus saying that. Anybody that would come up and say nonsense to Jesus, you know what, I think Jesus was like, Jesus was very comfortable. He knew what the truth was. And no matter how much they tried to make Jesus, his face turn red and steam come out of his ears, never happened. Never happened. He trusted in his father all the time. And he went on. We're not there yet, are we? But you know what? We can learn to trust in our father all the time. All the time, friends. God is good. Some prefer to go farther than scripture. They say that because of our fallen humanity that fallen humanity that even when we are not willfully sinning that our nature needs forgiveness. Does your nature need forgiveness? The evil in my nature requires healing, not forgiveness. Sin requires forgiveness, yes, but evil needs to be repaired. There's a great those are two totally different categories. The theory of total human depravity is wrong. The Bible's true, Romans 3.11, it's true that there is none good, no, not one. That's true. But does that describe a person who has been empowered by the Holy Spirit and who cooperates in the development of the fruits of the Spirit? Does it? A person who's doing right in the power of the Holy Spirit, God is God's, it's God's righteousness happening. Even then, you know what, we have no righteousness that we can call our own. But it's also true that even the unconverted desire not evil but good gifts for their children. Matthew 7, verse 11, you might have heard of the famous, uh, well, it used to be famous, maybe time has gone on. But there was a woman singer named Madonna. And she was famous for, I want to make remember here, I'm in church, how do I describe this? I guess you could say she was famous for um, very lewd uh, kind of presentation in her programs. I'm going to leave it at that, okay? Somebody interviewed her, and they asked her, because she, she uh, had children, and they said, um, 
what programs, what television do you watch with your, ch with your children? She says, oh, I would never let my children watch TV. Isn't it interesting? She was a part. She was a she's a part of the sewer of immorality. Her 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 um, things that she she did, but she wouldn't let her own kid watch it. And the Bible says that even even the wicked want to give good gifts. To their children. Now, you know, I don't know her heart. I don't know her current situation, so I'm not trying to be hard on her, but I like the fact that even those that are all in the category of sin, they want to give something good to their kids. Now, if that's the way it is for the wicked, then what about us? Just as real guilt is possible through choice, so is real righteousness possible through chosen cooperation with God's provision and power. Our disordered human organism, you can call it if you want, our fallen nature, can pull, but it cannot choose. If it cannot choose, it cannot incur guilt or condemnation. And so again, you can't say to the judge, hey, it wasn't me, it was my fist. We're born as if with a disease. You know, we're born kind of like a drug baby. The police do not take the baby to jail for the drugs in its veins because mommy was on methamphetamines, but the baby is born into an awful situation. It doesn't need to be declared guilty or not guilty. They don't bring the drug baby before the judge and declare it guilty. They don't put a little orange baby jumpsuit on it. The baby needs to be healed. Guilt always has to do with one's personal choices. It makes as much sense to say that a man is born condemned for something he had no responsibility for as it does to say that the victim in a head-on automobile collision caused by a drunk driver who crossed the center line, that the victim is guilty. The victim's not guilty. The victim was somebody who in a world of sin was in the wrong place at the wrong time and the drunk driver crossed the line and now you have mayhem and, and, and sadness and evil and death. But that person wasn't guilty. It's not a crime to be on the same road as a drunk driver. It's just dangerous. Okay, let's go to part three. God takes the initiative. Let's talk about repentance. Repentance is a gift from God who has taken the initiative to bring it within man's reach. His grace is sent out in search of us before we understand we even need it. Not even repentance can be earned, and nor should it be considered human works. Only our Father makes repentance possible. Open your Bible to Romans chapter 2 in the verse four, number 4, the fourth verse there in Romans 2 verse 4. Or maybe you know it by memory. What does Romans 2, 2 verse 4 say? There's something that leads us to repentance. Okay, remember what it says? For the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Now I ask you, do you get any credit for repenting? Is it your goodness? Do you repent because down in your heart is some little spark of goodness? Is that why you repent? I'm sorry, my brother, my sister. That's not because, that's not why you repent. You repent because the goodness of God leads you and you respond. And so it starts with God. Our repentance, our best repentance, our only repentance starts with God. We score no points for repentance. It is only our repentance because God has made it possible for us to choose it. All the strength by which we repent comes from God. He draws us. Our part is very simple and it's very limited. We choose. He gives the gift. When you repent, you're getting a gift from heaven. You don't come to God and say, by the way, just so you know, dear Lord, out of some little goodness in me, I just want you to know that I'm glad you're good, but there's a little bit of goodness in me too, and that's why I repented. You don't come to God and smile and say that. That's, that's not going to fly. But still, you know what? We keep in need of God's help. Our nature is so disordered because of the fall that while we retain an appreciation for righteousness, God has to move toward us first. Only then can we turn 
turn to him. Because we cannot repent on our own, we can never claim credit for repenting. Turning to him is just part of being his friend. Repentance, literally turning the mind around, it's not a one-time ceremony or event. At every stage of our Christian experience, our repentance should what? Should deepen. We only turn because of God's intervention. We still seek to fill the hole created by human abandonment of him. Desire to worship is in us by design. We're constituted worshiping beings. But our basic nature has been turned from outward to inward, and now we seek fulfillment in the wrong places. And so that's what we tend to do. We will look every which way but God. Repentance is more than mere sorrow for sin and its results. The Greek word speaks of a change of mind, the Hebrew word of turning. Metanoia is the Greek word. Teshuva is the Hebrew word. It means literally to be going one direction and turn around 180 degrees and go right back in the opposite direction. Very literal. Repentance. Very important. Maybe you're not sure that it's a gift. Maybe you think that there's something that you, some little piece that you have. I want to be clear. Acts chapter 5, if you want to look at it. Acts chapter 5, verse 29 to 32. God grants it, and it's up to us whether we receive it. Listen to what the Bible says, and I hope you'll listen carefully. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. You remember the story, but listen closely to the part about repentance. We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. Now listen. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Friends, Repentance is a gift, and it's not a gift from you. <laughs> it's a gift from God. Christ's mission as Prince and Savior includes his giving to the people of God today the gift of a more than human repentance. Forgiveness and repentance belong together. The legal penalty for transgression is paid through Christ. The needed heart change is offered through Christ. He is Savior both on the cross and in the believer. Some have charged that last generation theology is built upon a mistaken understanding of the gospel, that it takes the emphasis off of God and it places it upon man. They say that in LGT or last generation theology or Adventism, it's all the same thing. They say that when we, that the ultimate, what this ultimately means is that man saves himself. Really. That's insane. Nothing could be further from the truth. We don't believe that. We don't teach that. That's the opposite of what the Bible says. I mean, now when Adam and Eve disobeyed, man was taken captive by Satan. He would have remained so indefinitely, and, but God intervened. The instant that man accepted the temptations of Satan and disobeyed, Christ stood between the living and the dead. Jesus volunteered to take our punishment and to stand in our place. And so every human being would be granted his own personal opportunity to return to God because Jesus, Jesus intervened. Jesus said, I'm going to make it possible for them to make a choice, to turn around and to choose me. And so Jesus made it possible. Without Jesus, there's no gospel. Without Jesus, there's no last generation. And without Jesus, there's no theology. There's just manology, you know, humanology. The word about humans. The word by humans about humans. That's all you've got. We want to go by the Bible, the word about God to man. Jesus made it possible for us to have a fresh start. Men and women would have a fair, informed opportunity to determine how they're going to align themselves morally for the rest of their existence. So God has the right to determine in what measure the lives of men and women become evidence that he's been asking, that he's been fair in asking for their undivided allegiance. God can decide how much evidence your life and mine what role it plays in the great controversy. There's people that want to say, it's all done at the cross. 2,000 years ago. But I look around and I say, that's strange, we're still here. Not to take away from the cross, but to remember 
But the Bible teaches us that God has a big plan. What is God's big plan? God is going to end sin for eternity without taking away your free choice. I mean, imagine that. You'll be free forever. But you'll never choose sin again. And God is taking the universe to that place. And that's not something that just, that we're just going to call in the angel lawyers and be done with it. God is transforming our hearts so that this can be the way it is for eternity. And so some people want to say, well, this makes, this makes the gospel man-centered. You're all wrong. If the Bible makes the gospel man-centered, then, then okay. But I, I don't believe it does. I believe this is centered on Jesus from front to back. But man is involved because Jesus is reaching out to save us. See? So, you know, bring on the theological opinions. Shout, shout them out at me. That's fine. But let's go by the Bible. And if somebody says that I'm a heretic but I'm going by the Bible, I'll, I'll just smile and, and try to follow the Lord Jesus. I hope that's your approach as well. God's making his own case, and you know what? I'm not his lawyer. We'll let God be his own lawyer. Let's go to part four, the last of these uh, chapters I've squished. But uh, let's talk about part four, no merit for our deeds. And I hope you'll double remember this one because we need this for the beginning of our next week when I'm going to talk about obedience. So this goes with it. But I can't do it all at once. So, Nothing we do in the Christian walk earns us even the slightest merit toward our salvation. Far from claiming any shadow of glory, our part is to bow before the cross and declare, 1 Chronicles 29, 14, All things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. Salvation is about healing and character. You read it in Isaiah 53. In Matthew 8, verse 17, Jesus will heal us. The gospel is far removed from mere legal declarations. Through the ages, God and Satan, they have vied producing their character fruits. Christ has a design for his followers. They keep his commandments with the same faith that made him an overcomer. We read Revelation 3.21, just one of hundreds of Bible promises. What's going to be the result? Our focus too often is about what must I do to be saved? Some seek assurance of their personal salvation more than to deny self and copy Jesus' example. Self-centeredness is easy. But God is doing more than that. God is putting enmity back between man and Satan. Genesis 3.15. So I'm not saying we can't have an assurance of salvation. We can. And we should. But that's not our focus. It's always a sign of false religion when people think that somehow they can earn their salvation. The clear sign of true religion is experiencing faith that works, Galatians 5, verse 6. Faith that works, that's what we want. That's what we want in our experience. Only God can judge correctly. Do you remember when the Protestant Reformation came, Christendom was what? It was overwhelmingly Roman Catholic. Many held to Catholic viewpoints on salvation. Of course, that was what the, that was the, what the church was. They affirm that men are saved in part by their own works. And I can read it to you out of today's currently published Catholic Catechism that in part, it's your own works carry merit toward your salvation. The Reformation was launched, you might remember this, not first against salvation by works, but against indulgences. That's how it began, right? The guy came through town with indulgences to buy, and you could buy those, and Luther, Luther said, Luther had a cow, and he should. He should. By the way, they still sell indulgences today. I remember there was a year, I can't remember what year it was, there was a papal jubilee year, not so many years ago, and they had a website all about the jubilee indulgence. It's not, it's not just 500 years ago. 20, it's live today. But anyways... 
The Bible contains, as you know, without going into the details, the Bible contains no doctrine of indulgences, no doctrine of suffering in purgatory. There's nothing truly like that in the Bible. The answer to our sin problem is not further suffering. The gospel does have a legal, a legal aspect, but it's more concerned with bringing people back from sin to righteousness. Some are ready to label anything touching on the necessity of obedience as being a form of self-salvation, but you know, it's God only who can read the motives. A working faith could easily appear to be salvation by works. We want to be changed so that God's honor takes first place. We're determined to follow the Lamb wherever he goes, Revelation chapter 14, verse 4. But we're not trying to impress him. We must not approach him as worshipers approach their pagan gods. Remember how the Reformation was launched? Luther, the monk, Luther, he had a, a trip that he was able to go to Rome. He was so excited. It was awesome. He's going to go to Rome. This is the height of spirituality. And so he went to Rome. And when he got to Rome, he saw every kind of immorality and vice in the streets. And there was everything there to take your money. And, and finally, he, was, uh, he paid for an indulgence to climb the staircase and kiss each step on the way up. And he would get some credit for that towards his salvation, you know. And as he's going up the staircase, God flashed into his mind what he'd already read in the scriptures. The just shall live by faith. And Luther got up and ran away from there as fast as he could run. And the Reformation broke out after that. There was a man that heard God's voice. His conscience was open to the king. And he was so embarrassed that he had been kissing the steps and climbing them on his knees and trying to earn his salvation. Friends, we cannot earn our salvation. Never. Not any which way. God wants us in the kingdom. But we're not trying to impress him. Our relationship with him is secure. We can trust him. But you know, Luke 12, 32, he says, It is my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's not that we do nothing at all. It's that in the doing, we're not earning or attempting to appease God. A Christian will be doing. Ephesians 2, verse 10 says, We're created in Jesus for good works, right? James chapter 2 tells us again, faith will have works. But nothing we do in our own strength apart from God can have any part in saving us. Some insist that even the work that God does in us has no saving effect. Did you know that? Their gospel is limited to their misunderstanding of a few lines from Paul's Romans and Galatians, largely ignoring the gospels in most of the Greek and Hebrew scriptures. The larger thrust of the Bible is missed. Some theologians say, and I could give you names, Say, if you want to know the gospel, read Romans 3, 4, and 5. And the same theologian said, Paul knew the gospel better than Jesus. That is absurd. That is crazy talk. Listen, you want to talk about the gospels? The gospel transforms. Matthew 1.21 tells us that Jesus came to save us from sin, and it informs us that not only Jesus, but Peter did, in fact, walk on water. Mark teaches the true relationship with God comes from doing, not just hearing, Mark chapter 3. And that it was the faith of blind Bartimaeus that made him whole, Mark chapter 10, verse 46 and following. Luke tells us that the prodigal needed to return before he was restored to his privileges as a son, Luke chapter 15. Read it yourself. He said that it was while the lepers were in the very process of obeying Christ's command that they were healed. Luke chapter 17. Read it yourself. John states that Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, commanding him to take up his bed and walk. And immediately he did. John chapter 5. That it was not Christ, but the Father who did the works that appeared in Jesus' life on earth is mentioned in John 14 verse 10. But Paul knew the better better than Jesus. He knew the gospel better than Jesus. <clears throat> no. No. You will not make me mad, but no. <laughs> Paul shows the same transforming gospel. It's the only one he knows. 
It's the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1, verse 16. Not the hearers of the law, but the doers of the law will be made righteous. Romans 2, verse 13. Jesus overcame in our flesh so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, and on and on and on. Salvation means a renewing of our minds. Romans 12, 1 and 2. What a promise. And while we're not saved by our own effort, Titus 3, verse 5 tells us that what does save us is the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You're going to be saved without the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit? Paul urges us, Hebrews 6, verse 1, and now I'm going to come to the P word. Uh-oh. Paul urges us to go on to perfection. Now, you don't hear me use the word perfection very much. Perfection is a word that seems like it's loaded with bullets and it causes people to break out in hives. So I will not speak too much about perfection, but let's say something about it. First of all, we're urged to go on to perfection, Hebrews 6, verse 1. Jesus doesn't leave us where we are. He lifts us up to heavenly places, Ephesians 2, verse 6, right? It is his plan to stand on Mount Zion at the end of time, Revelation 14, right? With a transformed people who have walked with him until there's no guile in their hearts. The Father's name is in their foreheads, Revelation 14, 1 and 5. And so they're without fault before the throne of God. And another word we can use where we have the word perfection in English, a lot of times we can use another word, maturity. Maturity is a pretty good word for that because of the original, the original language. It, it fits. It's just right. I want you to keep clear two different kinds of perfection. Character surrender and character maturity. Perfection of character is attained and maintained throughout our Christian lives if we persist in character surrender. In fact, I'll say this, and if you remember one thing from all these words today, the only condition for salvation, the only condition for salvation, really, is character surrender. Character surrender. If you surrender when God calls you, you're going to be saved. We live up to all the light he's granted us. We turn to God at every occasion of testing. We surrender to him every idol just as he reveals it to us. Many times we don't surrender it right away, which is dangerous, but we surrender it, surrender it, and God will receive you. And so we can be perfect at every stage of growth. I don't know if you, how many of you planted gardens this last year. Based on the uncertainty in the world, I would say we should have large gardens this spring. But, you know, the plants in your garden, they can be perfect at every stage of growth. You don't plant the tomato the first day and look out there the second day and say, this is terrible. There's not even a, the, the tomatoes aren't ripe yet. It doesn't work that way. So at every stage of growth, God wants to perfect us. Perfection is never equality with Christ. Perfection means neither lack of weakness nor absence of mental or physical mistakes. No one is perfect. No one who is perfect will ever feel that he's perfect. So if you're waiting for a day when you can turn and say to your spouse, laying there in the bed in the morning and say, oh, this is a great day. You know what, dear? I'm perfect. Don't wait for that day. Don't wait for that day. Even if you are, you will not feel perfect. Perfection is an unbroken exercise of faith which keeps the soul pure from every stain of sin or disloyalty to God. Perfection refers to the dynamic growing lifestyle of the person who reflects the life of Jesus. He no longer yields to rebel sinful desires. That's what perfection is, that you just come to the place where you're following God at every step. And I know that we're not there yet, that we're in God's strength, we're moving there, and God is... God wants us there. He's helping us. Perfectionism emphasizes an absolute point beyond which there can be no further development. And that originates in Greek philosophy and uh, not in the Bible. We don't believe on imperfectionism. Certainly we don't believe in that. It focuses on a quality that's in man, that's internal in man, which can exist independently from the abiding Christ. And we've already said many times, and doubtless will again, there is no quality in, in us that is um, apart from God that's going to do good. There just isn't. It just doesn't. That's not the plan. It doesn't work that way. So beware of perfectionism. I'm committed to the vindication of God's character first. It is matured character that vindicates him. Now, 
how we're saved and how God is vindicated are two totally different questions. Totally different questions. Earth travels from Eden to Eden. In the end, a people are developed just as God asked Satan, have you considered my servant Job? So at the close of time, God asks again, have you seen my servants in the end time? Have you seen what happens when all the light of the gospel shines with all the power of the Holy Spirit on a generation that gives all their hearts to Jesus? That's what God says. Have you seen what happens? And then we come to us. And right now, I don't think we're really ready evidence yet. Do you? I don't think we're really ready evidence yet. But God is working. God isn't done. And at the end of time, he will have a people. We're saved apart from the law, Romans 3.28, but we're not saved without law. The Holy Spirit uses the law to convict us of sin, of what's right and what's just. The law cannot give life, but the law is holy, just, and good. Jesus' death on the cross, far from abolishing the law, upheld the law. Neither until heaven and earth passes away, his law will not pass away. And so, friends, we're just about done here. I want you to know that active cooperation, according to some people, it's Roman Catholicism. It's legalism. But I'll bet you nobody got pulled over and got a ticket today for driving the speed limit on the way to church. Things are fine as long as behaviors understood to be not truly matter in your relationship with Jesus. James warned against that kind of a view, though. Have we seen that God will make the last generation holy? Have we seen that in the Bible, that that's the truth? Now, we're going to talk more about justification. But I want to say one quick thing about sanctification. God's people, in the end of time, let God work in them. And it's a word we have called sanctification. God's work in us is sanctification. Now, what I'm about to say, the next sentence is considered to be all wrong by some theologians, some Adventist theologians. Sanctification is part of the gospel. The Bible teaches that. Sanctification is part of the gospel. God will, as a part of his gospel, sanctify the last generation. He will, you know what sanctify means, literally to make holy. Satan bitterly opposes every effort to keep justification and sanctification in a right relation to each other. But the final generation will understand and experience the full gospel when the righteousness by faith of scripture is operating in the life. God will finish what he's begun. And I would like to take you to one last verse here. And we'll go over to the book of Philippians chapter 1. And I warned you this was the fire hose, so you're very wet now. But let's look at Philippians chapter 1. One Bible promise. And what does it say? Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. You can be confident of this. Being confident of this very thing. 